So the places that we end up working are the places that you see here on the map. But I don't really want to talk about the stuff that we do. I more want to talk about a bigger picture thing, um, a problem that we frequently see in a lot of places that we work, and an approach that we've taken that seems to work fairly well for a lot of these places. So the context, the places that we work in, we're these places called, um, I call them internet black holes. They're places where fiber doesn't get to, and you only have essentially satellite connectivity, um, very, very, very poor bandwidth, kind of like it's basically dial up. Um, just to kind of like put in perspective, um, these are some like plans that we have available back at home, and you can't buy an internet plan bad enough to simulate what we have access to in the field. And that's not just like one person using it, we have a whole office of like 60 people connecting on very, very poor internet. So the situation is quite difficult to work with. Um, our offices, most like mostly in the field, are under a thatched roof, on a plastic table, getting around by canoe, and then walking through the bush to do our data collection. So we're in quite we're in quite remote situations, and we still need good applications and good data to help us do our work. Um, so one of the problems we have is it's just hard to get anything through the internet. So trying to load the Phosphor G website ends up looking like this. Um, it's there's a lot of errors and stuff that uh, end up coming through just because a lot of modern sites are quite heavy right now. And in a great, like with a lot of good infrastructure, you don't think about this, but we do have to. Um, so trying to just like browse like maps and trying to find like a hotel to like stay here. Um, this is about like five or 10 minutes what you kind of just stare at waiting to do that. So really what I want to talk about is how do you take GIS data, like open GIS data, and package it in a way that is consumable by people in low bandwidth and offline environments. So how to go from your starter map to a nice polished package. Um, so we were, I also want to talk about just making data more consumable for non-technical users. We have a great data portal called Humanitarian Data Exchange, and it looks like this, which for most people in the room here is probably fine, but for the average user, it's, there's a little bit of a barrier to entry to get to here. And so really good data needs good visualizations to really communicate what it says to the end user. So the first part of that, just talking about how do we make web maps available offline. So first, let's start with a classic kind of example. We need content and we need a template. So just for this example, let's say we're gonna use Mapbox Studio and put all our, our data and our styling in there. And then we're gonna connect it to um, a Mapbox GL template. It's gonna be some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we're gonna make a basic map like this. So if we're looking at it in terms of kind of internet infrastructure, what we have is essentially an object storage to store our template with our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then an API where we access our content with, which comes in the form of vector tiles. So this works well here in this room, but you take it out to the field and it just stops working without internet. So how do we fix that? One thing we can do is to turn this thing into what's called a progressive web app. So there are technologies that let you package websites and make them available offline. Um, the actual definition for a progressive web app is extremely vague. Um, the official documentation describes it as an experience that is reliable, fast, and engaging, which doesn't really tell you that much. But there is some concrete things that you can attribute to it. Um, it really means there's offline functionality and this means that you're gonna use a technology called a service worker. Um, so this is something that you attach to your page when it loads and when your page loads, it's gonna control your network requests and it's gonna get the stuff that you need from a cache, an offline available cache and then deliver that to your users. And if it can't find something in the cache, it's gonna go to the network and it's gonna get stuff from there. Um, so this looks like a, just a regular kind of caching service, but what makes service workers particularly useful for our case is that when it first loads, it has a list of everything that it needs to get for your app to work offline, and it prefetches those for you. And so it makes this nice, um, this nice discrete bundle that makes your app consistently work offline once you do take it off there. So let's say we enable this. We add some service workers to our website, and now we have this kind of offline experience, but it doesn't really work great with vector tiles or any kind of uh, dynamic server, just because there's so much content on there. We have, for just South Sudan, if you wanted to do a tile extract, you need more than four million different tiles. And that's just not a great approach for this kind of offline environment. So instead, 
let's just go back to using good old GeoJSON. GeoJSON is a nice discrete file format that has everything that you need in a way that you can just kind of package and send to users. And because we are using um, now just raw data, we need to also do some styling. So now we can kind of just get rid of that API and let's just say we just make a static site. We're just gonna put everything onto a GitHub repository and this will be a nice discrete package that we can send to people in the field. Um, so just to talk about styling, so I use a lot of Mapbox GL just because it has really great kind of vector capabilities, especially for kind of offline data. Um, it has a whole API just for styling your data and it can do pretty much almost anything that you want. Um, for the data, just some things to think about when you're, um, when you're conditioning data. Um, sometimes you have a lot of unnecessary stuff and because we want to make this data as consumable as possible, we should just get rid of the stuff that we don't use and we don't need. Um, additionally, there's a lot of extra geometry that maybe for the average person, um, they don't really need to consume this. Um, so an original file can be say a quarter of a megabyte, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on like edge, like on 2G edge, this can take eight seconds to load. So you wanna do a series of optimizations on your files and make sure that they do transfer fairly quick so you can truncate a lot of the precision and cut that file size in half. And you can just simplify the total number of points and just reduce the overall size by quite a bit. Um, also, just make sure your entire app in general, um, however you deliver it, just use the fewest possible resources. There's this huge trend of just bloating your websites with as many packages as you can throw at it, but this really provides a terrible experience for people with low bandwidth. So the end result of this, and I hope this video loads. Um, Hmm. Well, this will essentially show the um, this will essentially show the site loading, um, and the links at the end will just um, you can click on them and then you'll just see it's essentially the site loading and the service worker essentially just fetching all the resources offline. Um, so now I want to talk about maintenance. So that's essentially just designing a static site. So this is the approach that we generally take to deliver a lot of users um, to deliver stuff offline is we just make discrete static sites um, with no servers and no kind of like dynamic vector tiles. Um, so the thing with making these kind of sites is that as soon as you put all your like template and content onto a GitHub repository and then you kind of like leave the mission and somebody else comes to replace you, usually this thing becomes quite out of date really fast because even for us, this is super simple to interface if you have a technical background, but for somebody who's not familiar with this, this is just too much to work with. So what you really wanna do is you wanna kind of like separate those, um, the template with that data and you kinda wanna use something of like a map CMS. So you wanna kind of like treat your data and treat your styling as like you would treat a blog. So you essentially wanna kind of like think, I wanna like blog a map or like update a map. And you kinda wanna use a CMS to do that. Um, and the CMS is gonna have a very specific concern. It's only gonna deal with the data and the styling. And so I'm gonna make the CMS thing just kind of vague because this isn't really what's important. The important thing is what it deals with. And it deals with just controlling data and styling. Um, so if you can create one CMS to control one, um, one map, it can also do two or 20 or 200. And this can scale fairly well to control a whole bunch of different static sites if you can properly configure this. Um, additionally, like because you've like separated your concerns with styling and data, you can mix and match these things a lot. So you can use different data with different styles to achieve different kinds of outputs. And if you've developed this kind of infrastructure where you've kind of streamlined this process, you can reuse a lot of stuff. So if you have a lot of different data in a similar format, if you do have standardized data that adheres to a schema, you can apply the same styling to a whole bunch of different data sets. And this is something that we did. Um, we created a, an atlas for South Sudan initially, and then we had data for every single country bordering it, and we were able to apply that same styling to all the countries around it and produce all all these other offline capable maps for those countries as well. So again, this is a video and I haven't figured out how you actually play videos when you're in presentation mode. Um, but this would just essentially show that um, uh, the maps are listed out here um, and when you click on them, maybe I just, oop. Well, I can do this. Um, so essentially, 
you go to any one of these maps and all your resources, all your different layers are loaded out. Um, so a user who's just not familiar with really updating GIS kind of just uploads a GeoJSON, remaps all the attributes. Here in this case, this is a road layer. So they're just gonna remap the different attributes for the road layer. And then when they hit submit, all that Processing happens in the background um, because you, we use uh, TurfJS to just take care of all that minimization and attribute reduction. And so we really don't want people to worry about this because this is something that we just want to kind of like take the burden off of them for that. And so that's the, um, so that's the maintenance part of it. So now I'm gonna talk about the actual framework of it. So I was kind of vague about that kind of map CMS. Um, and that's because I kinda of wanna emphasize this thing called serverless. So serverless is a trend that just says um, you should minimize people's exposure to servers because these are really heavy resources that take a lot of time and investment to run. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't have servers in your workflow, it just means that user, you don't have to worry about them. So in wireless, you don't worry about wires, but they do exist at some point. Um, in this case, what we have is our static site is already serverless. We do have this kind of content manager, but people don't touch it. The, you can have either 10, 100, or thousands of users, and because they're all interfacing with a static site, you don't have to worry about this thing scaling. So, Stat so, the, um, so this is the, so the connection between how do you get content from, like, say, a map CMS to a static site um, is a little bit unclear here. Um, you could say, like, push your, you could push your data up to a GitHub repository, and there are some CMSs that do that. Um, but there's another concept that's come up recently called a static site generator. And a static site generator is a certain technology that um, it, takes, um, it takes content and templates and mixes them together to build a website. Um, so there's a huge consensus among the developer community to use Gatsby. Um, Gatsby is kind of just React with a few, thing, few extra things added on top of it. Um, and so you write your template with Gatsby and then you keep your content separately um, at some kind of like available at some kind of API. And then you use a build service that then pulls in your template, pulls in your content, and then delivers this discrete package to your users. And so the way that this gets updated is every time that there's a change in your template or there's a change in your content, this triggers a rebuild that then makes a new version of the site. So the entire site gets rebuilt from the source contents and then this new thing is then delivered to your users. So the build process that you use, you can use anything that uh, has pretty much continuous integration and continuous development. Um, I, we find that Netlify works really well as a service to, um, to just Pull, um, pull data and build it. And Netlify essentially has continuous integration and continuous development, which looks at code and related code and goes through a whole series of steps to rebuild your app and run a whole series of tests and build after that. And it also has this aspect of a content delivery network. And if you are delivering your, your app as a static site, you should have it as, you should have it put to a content delivery network because this reduces the time that your users have to pull in content. So instead of going from all the way across the world to wherever your server is located, your content is pushed to the closest server to your end user. And this provides a much more performant experience. Um, in this example here, um, data is stored in a server in New York and the further away you get from it, the longer it takes for that, um, the more latency you add to that application. Um, whereas if you have everything pushed to a CDN, every user has a very consistent experience because everything that they need to run this app is pushed to their, um, pushed closest to them. So this is kind of what we looked at before, but really this is kind of what a whole, the whole system looks like in the end. Um, so you have, a, you have a build service that then pulls in content from your CMS and pulls in templates from your GitHub repository and then builds this app that you then push out to your users. Um, and so we found this is generally the best way to push GIS, um, open GIS data out to as many users as possible in these kind of environments. All right, um, so last thing, um, just to talk about CMSs in general. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of organize your, um, your content. Um, 
Drupal and WordPress have been around for ages, um, and they're like they're valid options. We have specific things like GeoNode here that work specifically for GIS data. Um, but there's another trend that's come up is something called a, a headless CMS, um, and this is something that um, that specifically separates the presentation of data from the management of data. And so you use a static site generator and you design all your templates to present your data in a certain way and you use a completely different other system to then just control the way that it's published and updated. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different options out there and you can pull, um, you can pull and try any one of these. Um, for our work, we've used each of these and they all worked to kind of varying successes. But we found that if you do want to design a, a, really, a really nice and maintainable content management system, sometimes it, just, it's just, um, it works best to just go back to the basics and then just build kind of a general app using kind of fundamental building blocks. Um, so at first we used a lot of um, Amazon products. We used their authentication, API, database, and storage services. And these click together fairly easily and make quite an easy to design and easy to maintain content manager. Um, you can also swap out each of these for more, um, for more decentralized, more open source tools. Um, MongoDB, um, Apollo Server, these are all some things that, um, that also kind of work really well. But the, kind of, um, the idea is to kind of um, keep these four different parts separate as like very discrete concerns and then to have them all connect together in kind of a modular way. And so that's pretty much, um, that's pretty much everything. Um, these are some of the specific kind of technologies that, um, that we use in a lot of our projects. Um, languages that we use on the front end and then other things we use on the back end. And if anybody is developing um, some type of web apps, um, these are just some nice resources to kind of, um, to kind of look at. Um, there's, a nice, um, there's a nice website put up that, um, that shows just kind of like if you're going to start learning um, front end, back end, DevOps kind of things, um, which, which things should you start Googling, um, what should you start learning first. And there's also a great YouTube video out there that kind of um, describes um, this thing called the checklist manifesto where you, if you're going to build something, follow a, a very defined series of steps that make sure that you always built in best practices for your app. Um, so that's everything. Um, these are the links that I talked about. Um, these are the, the series of maps that, um, that, we've, um, that we've created and then uh, link to the GitHub repository um, for the actual code. Um, no, uh, so the thing with this, so the thing with Gatsby and a static site generator um, is that it does a lot of building on, the, on, on that build server before you push it out. So you don't actually deliver all of that React code to your users. It gets transformed into <coughs> mostly HTML and CMS and just a little bit of JavaScript that's necessary to then run. Um, so in your development environment, it's quite heavy, but it's really transformed into kind of just like um, just the fundamentals of web when you actually get it delivered. Um, so it becomes actually quite performant. Okay. Yeah. Have you looked at building the top JSON instead of GeoJSON? Yeah, I have. Um, so there's, a, there's about a million different things that you have to think about when you think about performance. Um, we did test out TopoJSON, but the way that Mapbox GL does reads is that um, Doing, um, trying to parse out TopoJSON into native GeoJSON, which it consumes, um, takes a lot of rendering power, and you need to balance rendering power with bandwidth. And for a lot of the low-end devices that were consuming these maps, it just took 10, 15, 20 seconds for them to just render the map. And so sometimes TopoJSON is great for like i7 processors on a desktop PC, but a, maybe a bad choice for a low-end mobile phone. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more on the CMS you're now actually using? So you mentioned you had a look at like a bunch of patterns CMSs, uh, yeah. and then you mentioned you're using AWS Amplify. Uh, um, what are you using in the end, and like what kind of interface uh, does that then entail? So you mentioned you can upload your JSONs and mm -hmm. set like stylings. What what are you using in the end? Uh, 
Um, so we're just using like um, we're storing all the GeoJSON in in, the, in our old way. It's like in like Amazon speak because I think like a lot of people are familiar with Amazon. Um, a lot of the GeoJSON gets stored in an S3 bucket. Yeah. Um, we have a few different kind of attributions for um, what the titles are going to be and like a few kind of just like um, like about sections in like a database. Um, these get pulled together in their managed API service. And then we use um, we use their their own authentication to control a uh, user flow in and out. Um, so this API is available from uh, via GraphQL endpoint. And then when the static site generator wants to pull in new updates, it accesses the content through that API and then pulls in the updated GeoJSON. Um, so the site itself is just meant to upload new data and then to provide a lot of automatic processing that goes on to the background. So the end user gets like a site with the form where you can upload a new GeoJSON and then that's getting pushed. Yeah, so the only the administrator really cares about that, you really don't want to, um, to have most of your users interact with the actual CMS. You want to kind of keep those, like the management and the visualization of data very separate so that whatever you deliver to most people who are consuming is as lightweight and stripped down as possible. Can you say a bit more about how it scales regarding heavy maps and numbers of players and features that you would cache or did you try to cache offline? Um, so it, it um, so Mapbox GL is fairly good at handling a lot of layers. What it does is it converts GeoJSON to vector tiles on, under the hood on the fly. Um, it uses this service called GeoJSON uh, VT. And so when you're at very high levels, it cuts out a lot of the detail and then renders a much kind of like simpler um, it essentially does vector tiling at the client level for you. Um, so it does perform quite well with a whole bunch of data. Um, so our, like, a lot of our atlases usually are about like 9, 10 megabytes, and these provide a fairly good experience for most of our users. But then you, you, you lose precision as you zoom, zoom in? Well, you, like, you keep the maximum precision of whatever you upload, and then when you do zoom out, under the hood, it's simplifying a lot of things for you so that it doesn't take as much processing power for the client that's consuming your map. Okay. Yeah? Uh, uh, just because I'm not familiar, uh, what is the storage uh, limits on uh, the service worker APIs? Uh, are you able to uh, Yeah. Um, to so service workers generally can cache about 50 megabytes per site. Um, that's not really a hard limit, but some browsers implement it differently, and that's kind of the safe maximum that you can go up to. Yep. How do you deal with caching when someone updates something in the CMS, how it's delivered to the users? Um, so service workers have this thing called a manifest, so it has a list of every file that's, um, that's included, and each one of those files has a hash signature, and then one, if one of these hash signatures changes, it will then just refetch that new file that's been uploaded. So it keeps everything that hasn't changed the same, and it just pulls in new data. So it's a feature built into service workers that intel intelligently knows that um, some, content, um, some content needs to be refetched from the network. Okay, all right, thanks everybody.